How you doing today? I uh, get a lot of emails, a lot of questions, stuff like that uh, about guns. One of them I get all the time, um, get it a lot in my pawn shop from people that are new, that are just getting started in guns, they don't know what they want, and they say, you know, what kind of gun should I get for concealed carry, for self-defense, for home defense? And uh, <clears throat> I see a lot of answers on YouTube, but most of them, they, they tell you the choices, but nobody really gives you an answer. And I, I've been working on this for a while. I got a lot of notes. I don't usually take notes, but on this, it's, it's gonna to be tough for me. And I'm gonna cut this up into a several part series. But I'm gonna to try to help people that don't understand guns or are fairly, fairly new at guns or have been a sportsman, but not really into self-defense. And I'm gonna to try to help you pick the ideal self-defense gun. Um, as I cut this up, I'm not going to do this introduction for everyone. I'm just going to do it on the first one because I hate a video that, that rambles on for 10 or 15 minutes before it gets into the topic. So anyway, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the sizes and the types, the various actions, calibers, the cost, whether brand is really important or not, whether it should have a safety or not. And then when I'm all done, I'm going to give you some scenarios for different people and give you the gun that I think would be best for those. So I'm, I'm gonna get started here. To me, the, the most critical thing that you, can, that you can decide in a gun is what you're gonna do with it and what size gun to buy. And those, the reason I tie those together is I, I think that that is the, the single most important factor. I, so many people come in here and buy a large gun from me. They want a big caliber, big gun, and then they end up never carrying it. I talked to him later and I said, well, I bought it to carry, but it's just too big. Or people come in and they say, I want a home defense gun. And then they look at a small 380 and they say, well, I don't really want a big gun. And I, I just want to point out to you that the, the most critical thing is to get a gun where the size and the type of gun match the intended use. Uh, I don't believe there's a one-size-fits-all, one-purpose-fits-all one type gun. The more you compromise on anything, the less of any good quality you get, and the more you get something that's just basically mediocre. Uh, in guns, you, you have revolvers and you have semi-autos, and I'll, I'll get into that later, but you have your, your full-size guns. Each one of these guns was checked before the video, but I'll check it again. You have your full-size gun. Then you have uh, more of your, your compact type gun, and then you have your really small subcompact uh, pistol like this. Same way with the revolvers, you have a big, uh, more of a service size. Now there are bigger hunting guns, um, but I'm not gonna get into those, but this is like the standard service size revolver. Then you have the, uh, again, the smaller pocket and uh, concealed carry type revolver. Um, if you're going to defend your home, ideally I think you want a, a larger gun with a higher capacity and a larger caliber with a larger stopping power. If you want to carry the gun, I think you need to check your ego at the door and realize that the bigger and heavier that gun is, the less likely it is to carry it. Routinely I get guys in here that, are, that have this attitude and they say, well, I wouldn't carry a 380. It's only going to make somebody mad. That, that, that's a stupid statement. I mean, 380s are not the best, obviously, on stopping power, but they certainly have effective stopping power, especially with the newer ammunition. Uh, the jackets are thinner now, the powders are better, and the 380s have more stopping power. So, you know, you need to get rid of those old strange misconceptions and myths and prejudice and realize that that a 380 is better than no gun. A, a 22 is better than no gun. A 45 is better probably than a 22. But a 45 at home is not as good as a 22 in your pocket. So I, for size, I think you need to get the biggest gun that you honestly know you will carry every day. I own a gun shop. I shoot a lot of guns. I find myself constantly going back to the gun that's in my pocket right now, which is a 380. I have guns staged around the store that are bigger, more powerful. Uh, you know, I have some 40 caliber guns in here, but I don't carry. 
I have a Slimline 9 that if I'm going somewhere, uh, I don't want to say dangerous because I don't really go dangerous places. The best thing you can do is self-defense is stay away from any place you think you're in danger. But, but you know, if I'm going somewhere where I think there's more of a chance of encountering a problem, I'll usually carry a single stack 9 millimeter. Um, if I'm on the road traveling, I'll have a, a larger high capacity 9 millimeter with me or, or a 40 because I, I realize that most likely it'll stay in the car. Um, as I get into this, like I said, I'm going to go into the, the differences between the semi-auto and the revolver. But like I say, for, for this first short one here, it's mostly an introduction. Figure out your primary use. If you're going to carry the gun, buy it small enough, you'll carry it. If you're going to use it in the house, buy it large enough that it'll have maximum stopping power for your ability to control it and maximum capacity for your ability to, to get a good grip and, and fire it. Uh, the other thing to take into consideration on that would be your level of skill uh, and your willingness to practice and familiarize yourself with it. Uh, like I say, I'll be back on, I don't know how many parts this will have, um, but I'm, I'm gonna go through the various factors and try to get it so that you have an idea of what gun to pick for your self-defense gun. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about, and it it's, comes up all the time in the store and occasionally in emails, is should I buy a revolver or a semi-automatic? And I hear all the time, well, I want a revolver because revolvers don't jam. And while it's true they may be less likely to jam, a revolver can jam, especially if you carry it in your pocket and not in a holster. A revolver gets dirt, debris down in it, it it's going to to restrict that cylinder turning and it's liable to bind up. It won't technically be a jam, but it can bind up. Um, it also is, is like anything else, if you don't maintain the revolver, it's, it's still a machine, it still has moving parts, it's gonna be stiff, you know, it, it's gonna have problems. I mean, no machine is completely trouble free. I, I would agree the revolver is probably less likely to malfunction on you, but it is possible. So that's the first thing you need to understand. The second thing is the newer semi-autos are amazingly reliable. The ammunition's better, the guns are better, the manufacturers do a better job with the feed ramps and the fit and the finish. The guns are typically built now with tolerances that are more designed around self-defense and less designed around accuracy and sportsmanship. They're still plenty accurate for self-defense, but they're not the target grade uh, of accuracy that you'll find with a fine match gun. A good match gun is going to be much more likely to, to malfunction. If the tolerances are tight, it's built for one thing, and that's to deliver maximum accuracy, not maximum reliability. Uh, in my opinion, the thing to look at is what do the police use, what does the military use? And almost without exception, the police and the military have gone to semi-automatic. Obviously, if there was that much of a reliability issue with them, the police and the military would still be carrying revolvers and they're not. Uh, I, I'm a guy who believes in looking at what's happened in the past and using that to indicate what's going to happen in the future. And the simple fact is a semi-auto has, has become the, the almost exclusively go-to primary weapon of police departments uh, anti-terrorism squads, military, anything like that, and those are the people that are far more likely to get into a self-defense scenario than the average citizen. If they believe in the automatic and the reliability enough of it, then I believe in it. The automatic also is typically flatter, which makes it easier to carry. It's typically higher capacity, and it's just, in my opinion, an easier gun to shoot. The newer striker fired type automatics, semi-automatics, I'm not a word parser. Uh, the semi-automatics have a more consistent trigger, usually more friendly than the double action trigger in a revolver. If you cock the revolver while you're holding somebody uh, in a self-defense scenario, you're very likely to have an accidental discharge. In my opinion, the semi-auto is the way to go. Um, everybody has an opinion, that's my opinion.
The next question that I get all of the time is safety or no safety on the semi-auto. I'm moving into the semi-autos now because I believe that's the preferred concealed carry gun. If you want a revolver, that's fine. The J-Frames are a great revolver. They're a great backup. They're a five-shot gun, though. So uh, in the safety, non-safety, again, I look at what the police and the military do. By and large, most places now have gone to a Glock-style pistol that does not have a manual safety that needs to be manipulated under stress. In my opinion, safety is a great marketing word. It, it brings up this image in your mind of, of being a, a more safe and practical way to operate your firearm. However, it's a button or lever that has to be operated in a stress situation, and it's also a mental crutch that tends to be relied upon. The proper safety with a gun is don't point it at something you don't want to destroy, and don't put your finger on the trigger until you're ready to shoot it. That's what's proper. That's what the police use. Police carry Glocks. If the safety was really better and, and really did reduce accidents, the police departments would have went with a gun that had an external frame mounted or slide mounted safety on it and require their officers to train with it. In my opinion, a gun without an external safety with a long consistent double action pull is the way to go. The Glock has numerous safeties built in it. I don't know what it is, I, three, four, I don't know. One of them is there is a small block on the trigger that keeps it from accidentally being bumped to the side. It also has internal safeties that keep it from firing when it's dropped. The Glock is, is like I say, universally accepted as the number one combat style gun. Not everybody believes in the brand, but almost everybody now makes a striker fired gun with some form of a safe action trigger and that's what almost all law enforcement and military departments have went to. There's just no doubt in my mind, in my opinion, a, a firearm without an external safety to manipulate under stress is better for the average shooter. All right, I talked about whether to have a safety or not. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the actions so that people understand them. There are two basic types of actions on a pistol. There would be the single action and double action. In the double action, there would be the double action with a hammer that goes from double action down to single action after the first shot's fired. There would be the double action only, which would still have a hammer, but each time the hammer moves forward again and requires the trigger to pull to bring the hammer back. And then, of course, there's the striker-fired gun, which in my opinion is still basically a double action, although technically it is, it is different, but it does require a full stroke of the trigger each time and does not leave you with a short uh, trigger pull on a cocked hammer. I think that the cocked hammer with an external safety is okay for someone who's willing to just fanatically practice, who's great at handling stress, and who wants to use that style of gun only. In my opinion, you're much, much better off with a double action only, either in a semi-auto or if you prefer a, a revolver, you can use the, the standard revolver without cocking it or they even make double action only revolvers. Or I believe you're better off with a striker fired gun again with no external safety. In my opinion, the absolute worst situation you can be in is to have a firearm in a cocked single action mode pointed at a potential bad guy with you loaded down with adrenaline under stress shaking nervous and you counting on holding that person at bay without accidentally touching off that gun and and killing or severely injuring them the law allows you to intentionally defend yourself it does not allow you to negligently shoot someone if you have someone who's no threat to you, you've cocked the pistol, you have them held there waiting for the police or, or whatever, and you accidentally shoot them, at, at best case scenario, you're probably going to be looking at a civil lawsuit and you're possibly going to be charged with manslaughter. In my opinion, and again, this is, this is pretty much backed up by the fact that more and more law enforcement and military agencies have gone away from the cocked 
single action style guns like the 1911s or a lot of law enforcement back in the revolver days even had the revolvers modified or bought them so they were double action only. And the reason for this is under stress, it's very, very hard to manipulate a, a fine motor skill. And uh, I just think you're much, much better off without a single action type gun that is in a cocked and ready to fire position relying on maybe a tenth of an inch of trigger stroke. Let's move into caliber. Caliber is a great debate. Um, I get it in here all the time. Uh, oddly enough, it's almost always with guys. It seems like the more uh, openly big caliber they are, typically the less likely it is that they have a gun in their pocket. Caliber is important. There's no doubt about it. And I think that you're smart to have the best and most powerful caliber that you will carry, will practice with, and can control. I believe a 380, in my opinion, is the bottom of the line. I believe that with the modern ammos like Critical Defense, which I think is the best ammo on the market, I think a 380 has plenty of reliable stopping power. I think that it functions well in the gun. It's center fire, so it's less, much less likely to have a, um, a misfire. And I just think it's a good all-around caliber for most shooters. Now, the downside of the 380 is the guns are small. They're typically a little harder to control. But since the recoil is not massive, almost anyone can learn to properly handle and shoot one. 38 is good, 357, 9mm, 40, 45, <clears throat> they're all good. The problem is as you go up in power and size, you go up in the weight and the size of the firearm, which I think greatly decreases the likelihood that you'll carry it. Also, when you get into the things like the 357, the 10 millimeter, even the 40 in a smaller gun, they're not real pleasant to shoot. And I think it, it greatly cuts down on the amount of time that you will practice with the firearm. And practice and training are critical. There's a big difference there. Practice would be like dry firing, bullseye shooting. Training would be operating under scenarios against time or pressure, uh, giving you more of a clue as to how you're going to react in a self-defense situation. Uh, there's a big difference. Like I say, you can practice dry firing, but the only way to train is with some type of pressure. <clears throat> um, back to caliber, a, a rim fire is better than nothing, but rim fires are more prone to misfires. And typically the 22, although it may be lethal, it may have killing power, but it is not going to have the ability to incapacitate an attacker. That's one of the things that people don't understand. They, I hear all the time, they say, well, X cartridge has killed more people or X cartridge is lethal. Maybe. Lethality and stopping power are not the same. You want something that will terminate the attack before the attacker harms you, not something where, where you're concerned ultimately about whether they wander off and bleed to death or, or whether they survive. Uh, you know, ideally, I don't want to kill anybody, but my main goal is I want to stop that attack before they kill me. I, I want something that has stopping power, and that's, that's a big thing to understand. In my opinion, like I say, 380 is adequate for the job, and it's likely to be carried. When you pick your caliber, pick it based ultimately on the first thing I said, which was the size of the gun, second on your ability to shoot it, third on your dedication to practice with it. And just realize as you go up in power, they're more expensive to shoot and less fun. So like I say, take a look at the center fires. My recommendation is 380 or 9 millimeter. All right, I'm back. Uh, next, I want to go into the cost of the guns a little bit. That's something that's really misunderstood. A lot of people come in here and they say, oh, I wouldn't buy a high point, they're junk. And I said, why do you say that? They said, well, they're cheap. Well, that's true. You know, they, they are an inexpensive gun, but they're not junk. There are some guns that cost more that are lesser quality, and there are some guns that obviously 
that cost you know about the same that are lesser quality there are also guns of course that are more expensive that are better quality not everything is completely controlled by price it's, it's a good barometer it's a good place to start but just don't get caught up in the cost the other thing to remember is the cost of buying the gun is only part of it you're also going to have the cost of maintenance the cost to shoot it you can get into a 380 quite a bit cheaper than a nine millimeter typically not not always but typically a uh, you know a Taurus 380 231 dollars here uh, a Glock 43 is almost 500 bucks but nine millimeter ammo is nine dollars and 88 cents a box right now at Academy and 380 ammo is about 22 dollars a box so at half price it doesn't take long until the operation of that nine millimeter will end up saving you enough money to offset the initial cost. So don't, when you look at the price of the gun, look at the cost of the accessories, the cost of the rounds for it. I routinely see guns in the closeout bins, not necessarily closeout, but I mean on sale, that are in some of the more obscure calibers like 357 SIG or 45 Long Colt, something like that. And those guns are marked down sometimes $50 or $100, but the cost of the ammo forms $45 a box. So if you're paying $35 extra dollars a box, just remember, you're going to have to practice and train with this gun. And it won't take any time at all until the difference in that ammo will, will offset that savings. My recommendation there, buy a 9mm unless the gun is going to be too big or unless you're just absolutely sure that you cannot handle that extra recoil. Uh, that's personal opinion. Also, don't forget in the cost of the gun, if you buy a gun that's a more common brand, I believe brand is meaningless. I, I, brand means nothing to me. But the one place that it does matter is in the availability of accessories. If you're a person that's going to want to buy two or three different style holsters, a laser, additional sights, Look for the more common brands like Glock. Uh, the reason is Glock is like Chevrolet. Everybody sells accessories for it. Glock sells them and aftermarket companies sell them. If you're a guy who buys the gun or, or whatever, but in this case a gun, and does not spend a lot of time or money accessorizing it, then you can pay more attention to the, the initial cost of the gun, the style, the fit, and not worry so much about the cost later of accessorizing the gun. Uh, <clears throat> I touched on brand. The only thing about brand is, like I say, accessory availability. And it does give some people a confidence. They, they buy a brand that they know and trust. Maybe they grew up with Smith & Wesson or Colt or Glock if they're a younger person. And that's one they've got a lot of confidence in. If that's the case and you can afford it, buy the brand. But in my opinion, we're blessed nowadays with so many good guns from so many great manufacturers at such great prices that I would completely abandon brand and go with the fit and the feel in your hand, the size, the overall visual appearance, how, how the texturing feels you know, to you, uh, whether you get a, an additional magazine. Those are the things I'd be looking at rather than the, the brand per se. But brand is strictly, is strictly a personal thing. I mean, you decide for yourself what brands you want. And, you know, that to me is, is at the very bottom of my list. Uh, this is my picks. And like I say, so many people, uh, they tell you they're going to tell you how to pick a gun and then they don't tell you anything. But I, I'm just going to flat out tell you, these are my personal opinions. You can agree with them or not. Uh, I'm welcome to listen to opinions unless they're hateful or have cuss words in them, then I'll just delete them. Um, if you have no experience at all and you're recoil sensitive and you want this gun for home use, then I say buy yourself a, a full-size uh, semi-auto in a nine millimeter, uh, and I'm gonna say a uh, Glock 17, if you want to call it a full size, a Glock 19, it's a little too big, I think, to be considered a compact. A Smith & Wesson M&P, a, uh, you know, Taurus uh, PT-111. Uh, any good high capacity double action slash striker fired system 
9 millimeter, in my opinion, is the perfect home defense gun for someone who's somewhat recoil sensitive and limited in experience. I think it's the easiest to operate under stress. It has high capacity. It has great stopping power. It's affordable. The ammo is affordable to practice with. Uh, if you're that same person and you have to have a revolver, buy yourself a large service revolver. Smith & Wesson 357, Taurus 357. Uh, you know, one of the bigger double action service revolvers will be great for you. You can shoot 38 Special out of it to control the recoil. It is going to be more expensive to practice with. You're going to give up some capacity, but you'll have that revolver that you want and you'll have it in a full size gun that'll be much easier for you to control. If you have no experience, you're recoil sensitive and you want a concealed carry gun, I believe you should go with a, with a double action style thir, uh, 380 semi-auto like a Taurus TCP, a Ruger LCP, a car, uh, I believe it's the um, CW380, uh, you know, one of the smaller double action style 380s. The reason is I believe it'll be with you. If you absolutely cannot stand the thought of that small of a gun, look at the single stack nines like the Glock 43, the Ruger LC9S, the Taurus 709, the uh, kel PF9, that style of gun. Uh, you'll gain some in the affordability to shoot it, which will help you handle the, the extra power of the 9mm, and you will also pick up a round or two in capacity. The only thing is it gets almost impossible to pocket carry that comfortably. Some people with real big pockets can, but you'll probably end up with a holster. And I find that the more you use the holster and the less you use pocket carry, the less likely you are to have the gun. Uh, if you're the hunter, sportsman level guy, home defense, I think you're smart to go with what you're probably used to, which is a large revolver in a 38 Special. Uh, the sportsman is a guy who's, who's probably not as familiar with the combat style guns, but he is going to be pretty familiar with the hunting type pistols. And I, again, believe that the 38 Special 357 is a great gun other than the capacity. It does limit you to six rounds, but uh, a sportsman will be quite familiar with that gun, quite able to handle it. Again, I do not recommend that you cock the firearm while you've got somebody covered with the muzzle because I think there is a great potential for that. If uh, you want to go with a semi-auto, I recommend that you again go with the large double action type. Since you're a sportsman and used to a hammer, I would go with the, the hammer operated or hammer fired type guns like the CZ-75, guns like that that have a uh, first pull double action pull and then go into a cocked mode. Just remember you have to practice with that because once you fire it, it goes into that single action cocked mode. It is going to be much easier to discharge. But again, I just feel like the sportsman oriented type person is more comfortable with the visual of a hammer that they can see. Uh, I think the CZ-75 is a great gun. Um, that's one that I would have no hesitation to recommend it at all. High capacity, great reliability easy to operate. Um, I, I think that's a good one. If you're an avid shooter, again, I recommend that you go with the, the uh, for concealed carry, the smaller double action striker fired type 380s, uh, or if you want to carry a revolver, the Smith J frame revolver or Taurus Model 85. Uh, an avid shooter, I think, in a, a home gun is, is very, very well served with the large Again, uh, double double stack, high capacity, nine millimeter with the striker fire, Glock 17, uh, the big Taurus, the Sig. Any of those guns will be excellent for you. Uh, I, I don't want to seem like I'm pushing Glock because I'm not really, but it's just one that everybody recognizes that style. That's why I use it as an example. I'm not pushing it necessarily for the brand. Um, <clears throat> if you're an experienced shooter in, in all forms and you, you train and, and um, you know, you're, you're willing to, to practice with your firearm all the time, and uh, especially if you train against stress uh, producers like a, a timer or in competitive environment, 
I, I think everything's pretty much open to you. You can carry about any type of firearm you want because you're probably diligently going to train and practice with it. Uh, and that is the one time when I recommend even the cocked and lock style guns like the 1911s because there again you'll have the familiarity and the training I believe to operate it under stress. The 1911 is a great gun. I mean shoot it's won uh, you know a couple of wars for us or, or assisted in winning them. Special elite units still to this day use them. It's just not the gun for someone that's not. I highly recommend a 1911 like I say for an avid shooter who's willing to train with it a lot not for anybody else. Again, even an avid shooter, I think, is well served with a uh, with a uh, full size uh, striker fired high capacity nine millimeter. Again, like the Glock. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. the The bottom line on this is, pick the gun that's that's the most likely one you're going to use. That the size fits the purpose that you believe in and that you're willing to train and practice with. I hope this has helped you. My overall pick is, uh, like I say, and this is, this is strictly me, but I believe that a CAR CW380, a Ruger LCP, a Taurus TCP, any of those guns is the ultimate in conce concealed carry. I have one in, in my pocket right now. I mean, I carry one uh, pretty much everywhere I go. I, I love it. I, I find myself rotating in and out with some single stack nines and other stuff, but almost always in the mornings I get up and I go right back to the pocket carry 380. I believe it's a whole lot better than no gun and a lot more likely to go with you. For the home defense, <clears throat> again, Glock 17 or any full size high capacity 9mm, preferably with a rail, I recommend a white light on your home defense gun so that you do not have to operate a flashlight in one hand and a gun in the other or try to learn some kind of cross-handed technique. Uh, the downside, of course, to the white light is your muzzle will be covering someone when you're illuminating them, but I still believe that you're better off that way. It'll allow you much more control. I think a white light's essential. I think a laser is a good idea, but not mandatory. But if you get up in the middle of the night to move around in your home, you need a white light and you need one bright enough when you shine it on somebody at least for the moment it momentarily incapacitates them i'm going with glock 17 for the home defense gun uh, 19 if your hand's just not quite big enough for the 17 and i'm going to go with probably in my opinion all around for for the money the uh, ruger lcp or the car cw 380 in the pocket carry gun and that's what i think you should have um, again, these are all just my picks. I appreciate you watching my videos. Shoot me a, um, <clears throat> a comment. Excuse me, my voice getting a little scratchy. Shoot me a comment. Let me know what you think about it. Thanks a lot.